All right, so last time we uh, talked about a different coordinate system, a so-called curvilinear coordinate system. In our context, this curvilinear coordinate system was discussed in the context of uh, surfaces that are embedded in a three-dimensional space. Uh, in general, it, has, it can have to do with three-dimensional motion description as well. So there can be three coordinates. We had only two because the surface is naturally two-dimensional intrinsically. Um, and moreover, we took these coordinates to be sort of material lines that are moving with the surface and deforming with the surface. So we called them convected coordinates. Uh, in general, they don't have to move with the body. Remember the arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian concept we discussed before a long time ago. So the motion of, in fact, the coordinate system can also be different from the motion of the object. But for us, they were uh, the same. Okay? So the concepts that we've introduced have, are, are strongly geometrically based. Uh, in fact, the topic is called differential geometry. And eventually, it finds many applications, in particular in problems that have to do with interfaces, because interfaces are naturally two-dimensional, although your problem overall might be three-dimensional. And one such two-dimensional problem has to do with contact mechanics, and that's why I named this special topic contact mechanics. I would like to discuss, as a particular application, uh, in fact, in the context of contact mechanics, something called contact detection. And contact detection is something that arises uh, in the context of the analysis of the, eventually, the two objects which, let's say, approach each other. There is a upper object, okay. let's say like this, and then there is a lower object if you like bodies, okay? So when I draw this picture, imagine actually, maybe I should do it with, say, dotted lines like that. What you should be thinking is that there is a body up there, and I'm looking just at a piece in the vicinity of some point in between, right? So there is a object up there, I'm just taking a piece near the surface, and likewise there is a object down here, and what I'm doing is I'm just looking at a piece from that object. Okay, the object is actually extending right, back, forward, and downwards. Okay, um, and um, what I like to do is, or in the context of a contact mechanics problem, this object is approaching the other one, perhaps because it's going to impact, and eventually we know that they will touch each other, and as soon as they touch each other, they will apply certain, a certain pressure, and if there is friction, frictional tractions onto one another, and they will deform accordingly, and the motion is such that they never penetrate into one another because that's a physical constraint, but they can, of course, have relative tangential motion with respect to one another. They can have sliding with or without friction, right? So if you want to model this problem in a computational setting in particular, so in the context of so-called computational contact mechanics, the first step towards simulating such a problem requires that you are able to detect contact. In other words, whether a point, let's say, on that object is actually contacting the surface below. Okay? That's a simple problem. And visually, you see that, for instance, if I pick a point, let me say, let's say I pick um, this point. And I will call that point with respect to a coordinate system down there. Let's say, let's call it Y. Okay. And there is another, there, there is a surface down here, and you already see that, well, you can say the point Y is not contacting the lower body Y because there's a distance between them, right? So you, you usually see that. Now, when you sort of model this problem numerically, you have to calculate what that distance is and make sure that that distance is actually according to you, such that it does not 
uh, allow penetration. So there is a certain gap between the bodies. Okay? So before I uh, solve the problem in that fashion or, or model the problem in 2D, let me first do it in 1D. So in 1D, you would have the, or let me draw it over here. Uh, in 1D, you could have, for instance, a curve. So that would be associated with the, uh, let me say, the lower object, okay? So in the 1D setting, and then there is a, or let's say 2D setting, but then our surface is actually a line. And then there is a curvilinear coordinate. There is only one, right? Um, and if I pick any point on the surface, let's say x, let's denote the points on the lower uh, surface with x, and now x is, as we've discussed last time, parametrized on the surface by this curvilinear, curvilinear coordinate, um, xi. So now what I'd like to do in this 2D setting, okay, so that would be 2D and this would be 3D. Um, in 2D, I'd like to determine whether this point Y is actually um, in contact or it's uh, sufficiently close to the other surface or not. And so the condition that you check visually is, of course, searching for the minimum distance. So in other words, when I check for contact between two surfaces, I would do the following. So for instance, if I'm at that point, that's the distance between uh, the two surfaces, right? And uh, in order to check whether the points are contacting or not, on the other hand, what I have to do is I have to make sure that I search for the point that is that has the closest projection onto the other surface. The reason being a problem, let's say, right? Simple problem like this, right? If I'm here, that's point Y, and that is my surface, this point is about to contact the surface at that point. If I search the search for it or calculate the distance to any other point, it might be very large, but to this point it's very, very close, okay? So when you look at whether, or, or I ask you, at which point is the blue point about to contact, you would say about here. And what you're doing in your mind is searching for the closest point, so-called closest point projection onto the other surface. And geometrically, what's special about that closest point projection is that the normal to the surface aligns with the position vector that points from this point to its closest point projection, right? So the point that this blue Y point is most likely to contact at this stage as time progresses is probably that point and not any other point, okay? So computationally, uh, you would seek for a particular xi bar, okay? And at that particular coordinate, you have a particular value of x, and x bar is simply x evaluated at xi bar. And at this point, you have a normal, let's call that normal n, okay? And, um, at the closest point projection, the normal to the surface points from the point of closest point projection, so that's x bar, to y, the point that you are searching or you're trying to detect contact for. So similarly, on the surface, in order to see which point this point y is most likely to contact on the other surface, uh, in order to find that out, what we're going to search for is this thing called uh, closest point projection. In other words, we're going to search for a point x bar, um, which is x evaluates that two particular coordinates, um, c bar one and c bar two. So to do that, what you would do 
And what you naturally have in contact mechanics is you endow the surface with curvilinear coordinates because it's already a two-dimensional geometry. So these are your coordinates, let's say. And so you have, let's say, in that direction, C1, and in that direction, um, C2. Okay. And we could be looking at the value of x at any point, and the value of x is a function of C1 and C2. But there is a special point there, okay? And that point is what we called here x bar, okay? And that point is the closest point projection. And what's special about that point is that the normal to the lower body, to the lower surface, at the closest point projection is such that it points from x bar to the point y, okay? So the answer to the question, at which point is y most likely to initiate contact with the lower surface, the answer is at x bar, okay? So we have to find out what x bar is um, in the context of contact mechanics, and that's the uh, topic of contact detection. So, numerically, we have a parametrization, or theoretically, you have a parametrization of the surface. You know what this point y is, so that's a given, and I'm searching for the closest point projection um, from the upper surface to the lower surface. So, to, do, to carry out the projection, the first step is to define a gap vector. The gap vector is simply the distance or the vector that points from x bar to y, all right? Um, and we know that that vector is in the direction of n, okay? If x is equal to x bar, okay? Because that's by definition our closest point projection. It's the vector that aligns with the normal. So of course, it has a sign in between, it has a magnitude as well, I'm going to denote it as such, okay, minus gamma. So presently, y minus x bar, it's this vector, okay, and is already in that direction, and the distance is, or, so n times whatever there is here, it should be positive because y minus x bar is pointing in the direction of n, so in that picture, gamma is negative. So in this particular picture, gamma is less than zero here, okay? So in other words, if I successfully carry out this closest point projection and find this point x bar, from x bar I would calculate, based on that vector and based on the knowledge of the normal vector, I can calculate gamma, and my calculation tells me gamma is negative, and from the calculation, without having any visual picture of the two surfaces, I can tell you immediately that these two surfaces are not touching each other because there is a gap between them. So what I've done with this very simple equation is I've allowed you to detect whether these surfaces are, in, are touching each other or not touching each other. If they touch each other, gamma is equal to zero. If this surface, or in particular this point y, tries to go into the lower surface, gamma has to be positive, okay? So as I do my calculations, these things work iteratively. So you have one surface, you have another surface. You make one surface approach the other, and at many different points of one surface, you check for closest point projection to make sure that none of these points are actually penetrating the other one. So you incrementally solve this problem, okay? And so you increment the position of the lower surface, perhaps because it's moving with a certain velocity, and you keep checking for the value of gamma at many different points. Everything is negative, 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 and at some point, whoosh, this happens. And that means that, well, you've taken a step from that configuration to that configuration numerically, but that shouldn't have happened because my hand penetrated the 
eraser, <laughs> right? So, so what has to happen, in fact, is this has to happen. This now has to touch the surface, and my hand has to deform so as to, let's say, conform to the geometry of whatever is trying to contact, right? So that's how contact mechanics works. It makes sure that there is no contact between the surfaces, and eventually, gamma allows me to detect contact and do something about it. So that's what we're going to talk about. But first, I have assumed that I know what this uh, projection is, but of course we have to find it. Now, first of all, um, gamma here is called the normal gap. Okay, and from this equation, I can dot both sides with the normal. And you can find that gamma is equal to minus, with a minus sign, y minus x bar dot n. Okay, so if gamma is greater than zero, contact is initiated, okay? So it's not physically allowed, but numerically, if you detect it, that means you have to somehow take care of that situation. Okay. Now, um, well, how do we find the closest point projection is the next question now that we have to answer. And here is where partially the tools that we've developed earlier immediately come into play by making use of the geometry of the lower surface where I have a curvilinear coordinate in this case, right? In fact, when you do the full calculation, almost all of the quantities, in fact, more that we discussed last time come into play during the cal calculations. You need pretty much everything that we've introduced last time. All right, so uh, that is the condition for, uh, or an idea we have about how to detect contact, but we have to find out what the closest point projection X bar is. Um, so we have to remember that X bar is a special point that has to do with two special coordinates, C bar one and C bar two, such that that condition holds. So that's the definition of X bar. Um, so it intrinsically, it is a three dimensional vector, but it intrinsically involves finding out two quantities. So there are two unknowns in my problem. That's just, um, that's just one condition. In other words, Y aligns uh, with the, or and aligns with the vector that points from x bar to y, I need two equations. And the way I can formulate those two equations is to say that x bar is the solution of, okay? So now, what I know is when x is equal to x bar, if it is equal to x bar, then it's in the normal direction, right? So if I take its dot with the first covariant vector at that point, g1, it should be equal to zero. And if I take its dot product with the second covariant tangent basis vector, it also should be equal to zero because this is a vector that is normal to the surfaces. So this therefore has or generates two equations for two unknowns, C bar one and C bar two, okay? Um, or, I can write this explicitly. I can say that C bar one, C bar two is the solution of, and now I'm going to write everything explicitly. Remember, G one is the derivative of X with respect to C one. Derivative of X with respect to C one. X itself is a function of C one and C two. So this here is G1, and similarly G2 is the derivative of X with respect to C2, uh, dotted with Y minus X, which is a function of C1 and C2. And this holds, right, 
if I'm at the coordinates that have to do with the closest point projection. So you know what the point Y is. You have a description of the surface geometry for, for the lower body. In other words, you have a function that delivers you the value of x for any c1 and c2. This might be a um, non-trivial function, but we assume you know what it is, and you can um, write down this function at least in a numerical setting. It's not a problem. And likewise, therefore, you can take the derivatives. You can take a derivative with respect to 1 and 2, respectively delivering the two uh, covariant basis vectors. And therefore, you have two equations that are, in general, nonlinear in terms of the two coordinates, xi1 and xi2. And you search for xi bar alpha such that the equality holds. So that's where you would have to solve two nonlinear equations in terms of two unknowns. So these equations are nonlinear. So within a typical, let's say, newton raphson type solution scheme that you might remember from uh, your numerical algebra or mathematics course, you would have to do some sort of linearization. And then you would have to take derivatives of these quantities. And that's where some additional um, constructs that we've discussed last time also uh, appear. OK. But we're not going to concern ourselves with the details of that solution. This is just the particular description and the way uh, for finding what the closest point projection is. So you go to a certain point, you solve these equations, and you find this closest point projection x bar or c bar alpha. And then once you know its closest point projection, you go back to the previous board setting and you find what this gamma is, the normal gap. And this normal gap, if it comes out to be negative, you're safe. The two bodies are not contacting each other. Otherwise, you have to do something about them. So in particular, suppose, as I discussed um, a little while ago, suppose you do the calculations, you find the closest point projection, you calculate the gap, and it comes out to be positive. So that's a problem because physically the two bodies cannot penetrate each other, but they seem to. So what you have to do in a numerical setting, somehow you need to take a step back and do something about that situation. And what you do is you initiate a contact scenario. And I'm going to discuss this in the context of frictionless contact where the bodies can freely slide with respect to each other. So in the context of frictionless contact, when two objects contact each other, um, there can only be normal pressure between them, no tangential traction. So that means that the traction is in the direction that is normal to the surface. In this case, n is normal to the lower surface. And if I'm going to talk about the pressure, it's compressive, of course. So if P is positive, I have to put a minus sign. So that is the form of the traction that acts on the lower surface, because the upper one is pushing on, it's trying to contact it. Okay? The traction that acts on the upper one is the minus of this one. Okay? It's because the interaction is equal and opposite. OK, so now the pressure is um, strictly speaking, okay, and here you can recall some closely related concepts that we've discussed before, in, the, in particular in the context of incompressibility, uh, where the pressure had a similar role. The pressure is, strictly speaking, in this context, a Lagrange multiplier that enforces the contact constraints, and it operates in the following fashion. So here, this axis is gamma, the normal gap between the two surface or a point on the upper one and the closest point projection on the lower one. And this is the pressure between them. And the way it theoretically should operate is the following. So first of all, if the gap is negative, that means that the two points are not contacting each other, right? The bodies are far apart, right? So now they're approaching each other. The gap decreases, decreases, decreases. And now you come to a point where gamma is zero. The two surfaces touch each other. If you try to push the surfaces further onto each other, you generate pressure between them. But the pressure is generated in such a way that there is never further penetration. So the pressure does increase, but gamma is always zero. So the condition of contact is initiated by the generation of a pressure that acts as a Lagrange multiplier, which prevents gamma from becoming positive. 
Okay, so it's a constraint that's being enforced, similar to incompressibility, if you like, right? So now that's how we can think about it. But the problem is sometimes it's hard to work with such a scenario, and what one does instead is what one calls regularization of the problem. In other words, we, would, we can say that, well, let's say we do allow the surfaces to penetrate each other, but just a tiny bit, okay? And I will make P a function of gamma, so it's like a constitutive formulation, okay? Where, right, in a constitutive formulation, the kinetics depends on the kinematics. You make a link between them. Normally, we make a link between the stress and the strain. So in this case, I'm going to make a link between a portion of the traction and a portion of the kinematics that has to do with the penetration. And I'm going to say that there is going to be a linear relation between them. Okay? So, so in other words, I say that, well, I do allow the two surfaces to penetrate each other, but the more they penetrate, the more force will be generated, and therefore, at some point, I'll find an equilibrium uh, and it will prevent the surfaces from penetrating each other indefinitely. There is some resistance. And this slope, let us call some parameter epsilon, okay? This parameter epsilon is called the um, penalty constant. And penalty regularization, in fact, it's a very simple approach to any problem with constraints in general in uh, optimization, in nonlinear optimization as well, right? So, well, ideally, of course, the, you want to obtain the solution that is as close as possible to the theoretical one that you want, the red line. So obviously what we want is a line that has a larger and larger epsilon. If you make epsilon increase, then this line will keep increasing. And eventually, it means that a tiny amount of penetration is immediately penalized by a large pressure. And it's almost like the red line. It's almost as if you don't allow any gamma. But you do, but just a tiny bit, OK? So <laughs> in that context, so what we are going to say is, right, in the context of penalty regularization, we're going to say that P is equal to zero if gamma is less than or equal to zero. In that context, I don't have to worry about contact, that this is entirely allowed. But if in my calculations gamma tries to become positive, then I penalize that penetration, ideally with a large penalty factor, so that the pressure is sufficiently high so as to prevent the penetration between the two um, surfaces. Okay? And the way that you ensure that you have a sufficient large epsilon is to somehow make a link between the value of epsilon and the elastic properties of the material. So for instance, you can say that epsilon is much, much larger than E, the Young's modulus, right? And the rationale behind that would be, well, epsilon somehow has to do with the penetration and local deformation of the bodies. If I make sure that epsilon is much, much larger than E, which governs that deformation, I can make sure that gamma is somehow uh, sufficiently small. So that would be one way to make sure that you have a suffi sufficiently large epsilon, to make sure that it's larger than uh, the Young's modulus, sufficiently large. Um, so this, of course, again, I highlight, it's a numerical approach. Theoretically, what you are seeking is the red line. Okay? In fact, there is also numerical methods where you directly work with Lagrange multipliers to ensure that you are remaining on that red line. Uh, but that's an other story. Um, OK. so. So, so therefore, in a numerical setting, now what we have is I have a point, and I have, in fact, let's say, two objects that are approaching each other. And let's say I have R1 and R2, two bodies. These are their reference configurations. Let's say 
you fix one body, fix where it is, and what you do is you apply a traction distribution onto the other body. And now, as a result of that traction distribution, this body is going to accelerate and move towards that one. So when I look at the current configuration, This will be R1, the first of the body, and this will be R2. And you have your force applied onto the lower object, so it's impacting the lower one. And what you do is you physically expect the initiation of some contact zone between these two objects. So now with the tools that we have, what you would do is you would systematically, as the upper one approaches the lower one, you would systematically pick, let's say, points on the upper body, green points, and you would find for every point on the upper body, according to probably some numerical discretization, its closest point projection on the lower surface. So for instance, for that one, it would be this one. And then you calculate the value of the gap. Oh, it's positive, so you don't have to worry about contact. So you make the upper body accelerate, move towards the lower one. But if it at, it at some stage you detect a positive gamma, then you initiate contact by activating this pressure. Let's say, according to penalty regularization, the bodies try to penetrate each other. But as they try to penetrate each other, a large Epsilon ensures that there is a sufficient pressure generated so as to prevent them from penetrating each other. So instead of the bodies penetrating each other, they will deform so as to generate this picture where you observe a contact interface. Okay, so this would be your contact interface. All right. And there is something strange about contact mechanics. So earlier in the course, what we talked about is two kinds of nonlinearities. I told you that there are in the context of soft matter, uh, soft um, mechanics of soft materials. I told you there are two primary primary sources of nonlinearity. One, geometric nonlinearity. Right? There is the infinitesimal strain tensor and the general large deformation strain tensors. If deformations are small, all measures of strain condense to the infinitesimal strain tensor. There is only one measure of strain. So that is geometric nonlinearity. And then in the linear, linear elastic case, sigma equals C epsilon. There is a linear relation between stress and strain. But in general, we've observed that strain is not linearly related to stress. So there is also material nonlinearity. Okay? So contact is a third type of nonlinearity that has to do with the boundary conditions or with, let's say in this case, contact conditions. And in fact, uh, even if you have geometric and material nonlinearity, linearity, in other words, if these two bodies, in other words, this deformation, if it's super exaggerated, so in other words, it's a small deformation problem actually, so this contact zone is tiny, tiny, right? Um, so the deformations are small. You can employ sigma equals C epsilon here, sigma equals C epsilon there. Do you have no source of nonlinearity? Yes, you do because of contact. And the reason is, if I normally wanted to solve this problem, let's say I have some, suppose I had some boundary conditions here. I keep this fixed, okay? So when you formulate that problem, because of if this is materially and geometrically nonlinear, that requires that the loads are probably very small, right? Deformations are going to be small. You can solve everything in the linear setting. And you know exactly where you're applying these displacement boundary conditions. You know exactly where you're applying these traction boundary conditions. Now, in the context of the contact problem, however, there is a funny situation because you know what this load is and you know what this displacement condition is. But to determine the individual deformations, I needed to know what the contact interface is. And the contact interface is unknown. 
its magnitude depends on the amount of load that I apply. If I push harder, the contact interface is going to grow. So even if the deformations individually are small, because of the fact that the contact interface is not known beforehand, introduce a nonlinearity, which means that this problem has to be solved in any case in some sort of a iterative fashion. So this is our third source of nonlinearity. So again, nonlinearity manifests itself through the fact that in a numerical setting, you have to pursue some iterative solution procedure. You cannot solve this problem in one shot, okay? Whereas the individual problems with prescribed boundary conditions on either body, for instance, on the example that I just gave, it can be solved in one shot, okay? So that completes also nicely and complements some of the things that we've discussed before with respect to nonlinearity. All right, so, um, in fact, that's, by the way, how I'm picking these topics, to make sure that there's always some link between them and there's some larger picture, uh, let me say, emerging. Um, all right, so uh, we discussed how one could ideally or numerically uh, handle contact. How about some problems that potentially do not require numerical solution, but they have an analytical solution? I'd like to at least discuss one such famous problem um, and it's called the Hertz problem. So it's one problem where you have actually, for a contact problem, have a, an analytical solution. Um, so, so Hertz problem is essentially a similar picture, right? But as I said, um, you can actually have the situation where the bodies are linearly elastic, so which means eventually geometric and material linearity. The problem is still nonlinear, okay, um, due to contact conditions. I'm going to assume that those contact conditions are frictionless. All right, um, and I'm going to assume that the surfaces are non-conforming. Okay, two non-conforming surfaces could be, for instance, drawn like this and like that. Okay, imagine there is some these are two three-dimensional bodies. Okay, they are contacting each other, and non-conforming means is that. One is curving up, the other one is curving down. So if you like, um, the signs of curvature appear to be of different uh, signs locally. So now, um, what would conforming mean, by the way? For instance, if I have that object and that object, that's a conforming contact. So one fits sort of onto the other one here. There is no such fit, right? Okay, that would be conforming. All right, so that's the problem we'd like to look at. And we're going to assign, because we're dealing with linear elasticity, in terms of material parameters, we're going to assign two material parameters, uh, the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio. And in this case, E2 and nu2. And subsequently, we're going to zoom on to this region where I'm going to initiate contact. So we're talking about linear elasticity. So that means that the loads are sufficiently small or the deformations are sufficiently small so that you won't really see the contact zone unless you zoom in um, significantly, right? And now we've talked about the idea of curvature last time. 
So the curvature you see on the surface is probably and most likely the way I've drawn, not a constant. If I pick the coordinate system um, accordingly, eventually, and the normals for each surface accordingly, I can find the curvature for each body in the manner that we discussed last time, right? Um, and in general, each body will have two principal curvatures, okay? And now I'm going to assume that those principal curvatures are the same. In other words, the tips of these two surfaces are locally like the surfaces of a sphere. That's what it means for the principal curvatures to be the same, okay? So locally, the upper body is going to look like a sphere. And locally, the lower body is also going to look like a sphere. Okay. So then I'm going to draw a, or indicate the radius that is associated with that geometry. So that would be inverse the principal curvature or the uh, radius of curvature. And the other one would have a radius of curvature too. So R is radius of curvature. And I'm going to write here just to remind ourselves that I assume them to be equal at either side for simplicity, meaning that in general you would have at that point two radii of curvature. In other words, the local geometry would be like a extended sphere. Okay, so this would not be a circle, but it would be an ellipse, right? Likewise down here. But I'm drawing circles, so in other words, locally the tips are described by spheres. Um, so yes, spherical tips. Okay. Just to simplify our life. Now, then eventually the two bodies will contact each other. Again, their formations are small. There is going to be a tiny contact interface that is going to be generated. So if I zoom in, I see that picture. If I zoom in further, that's the only way I can see the contact zone. Okay. This is the contact interface. So the region I'm analyzing is very small compared to the actual geometry, and the contact interface is even smaller than that geometry. So under those assumptions, let me say, roughly speaking, um, the solution to the problem is quite um, elegant and simple, and let me draw it on the other board. So the solution I'm seeking is very clear. I'm looking for how large the contact interface is, and I'm looking for the, a measure of the deformation between the two surfaces. So in other words, those bodies approach each other by a certain amount, and I'm asking myself, well, what is the force that is generated due to contact? It's a very simple question. And that's what the Hertz problem tries to answer. And the solution consists of first defining a so-called equivalent Young's modulus, E star. And it is defined in terms of the material parameters of the first and the second object. All right. Um, you also define an equivalent radius of curvature. Which is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2 in terms of the radii of curvature of the, of the two objects locally. 
Now, once you define these two, what you're essentially doing is you are um, condensing the problem to a situation where you have only one Young's modulus and only one radius of curvature. So since we have only one material parameter and one geometric description of the interface, um, what I can do is I can think of or I can assign this Young's modulus to a single deformable object. Okay, That is contacting a rigid surface. So the surface does not deform, and this object is deforming, and this object has a radius of curvature r and Young's modulus e star. Well, there is only one measure of geometry and one measure of material property. I can have a slightly different picture. So we have a in this case, a elastic indenter, the upper object indents locally the lower object, such as in uh, the tip of a uh, indenter of a uh, hardness tester, if you've done one. Um, and then the alternative picture is to think of the upper object, which has a radius r, indenting a elastic so-called half space. In other words, there is an elastic surface here that is very large in both dimensions. It goes down also in the depth direction. And then there is a rigid indenter now. That is trying to deform locally this elastic half space. And now you are assigning V material property to the deformable half space. And again, the geometry has to do with the elastic indenter with a spherical uh, tip. Okay. So the original problem contains two spherical tips with two different sets of material properties. But once we condense all of that information to a single material parameter and a single geometry uh, measure, then this is the way we can now interpret what we locally have either an elastic indenter deforming a rigid surface or a rigid indenter contacting an elastic half space. In either case, the information that we're looking for is, well, if I apply a certain force F, this elastic indenter is going to move down. It's going to deform and initiate a contact interface between the two bodies. Okay. And that contact interface is going to have a certain radius that I'm about to describe shortly. And as a result, this upper deformable object is going to move down a little bit because it's deforming and spreading on the rigid surface. Alternatively, if I have a rigid intenter and I apply a certain force, this rigid intenter is going to indent this lower body a little bit. And eventually, again, there will be a downwards motion by an amount delta. And I'm interested in what that delta is. And finally, uh, due to the generation of a contact interface, there is going to be some pressure distribution within this contact interface. And I'd like to also find what that is. And the solution of the Hertz problem precisely delivers us the answers to those questions. And I'm going to describe the pressure distribution through a variable p bar which is the value of the pressure at any point divided by the maximum pressure that you find out. And the other coordinate I'm going to describe as radial distance from the center of a uh, contact zone. So And this contact interface is circular. And the radius of that circle is going to be r max. Okay. The radius of that circle is going to be r max.
uh, the maximum pressure that I observe within the contact zone will be P max, and it turns out P max happens at the center. So the maximum pressure is initiated or it occurs at the center of the contact zone. I'm going to write what that is as well. And finally, I'd like to find out what the amount of uh, motion this displacement is due to the application of the force. So now, with respect to the distribution of the pressure, it, maximum pressure happens at the center. So P over P max, it's one there. When I move away, it's going to decay. The reason it decays is eventually at the edge of the contact zone, the two bodies will lose contact with each other. There is no more contact anymore. No contact means no pressure. So at the edge of the contact zone, uh, there is zero pressure. And that's the way the pressure distribution looks. And the function itself is P is equal, P bar is equal to square root, one minus R bar squared. So this is our normalized pressure distribution. So that's the solution that the Hertz problem delivers us. In doing so, it also tells us the values of these parameters, how they depend on the parameters of the problem. And the parameters of the problem are the force, E star, and R. So it turns out the size of the contact, contact zone, or right, the radius of the circular contact interface is equal to That expression, so that's an analytical expression. Um, I've tried to describe on the earlier board that we expect that size to be much smaller than the radii of the curvatures for the curvatures of the two body um, because deformations are small. Um, the maximum contact pressure is that. So F is the force, right, that you apply on the indenter. So F over pi R max squared is like the average pressure, but it turns out the maximum is 1 half or 50% larger than that. Um, and then finally, delta is So given the force and the radius of the, the equivalent radius of curvature and the equivalent Young's modulus, you can find what the, uh, what the motion, relative motion between the surfaces are. Okay. So that is a measure of the deformation due to the fact that one surface, in this case that one, in that case that one, it's actually deformable. Okay. So you apply the force, contact is generated and it deforms that surface. So what I can do from this equality is, and I'm going to use this shortly, I'm going to solve or express F in terms of delta. So I'm just going to invert this relation, take the cube and so on. So F is a function of delta, and it's equal to four over three square root R, 
E star delta 3 over 2. So that's a nice expression because it allows us to answer the reverse question. If I displace this rigid indenter, indenter by a certain amount delta, what is the force that is generated from this contact situation? And the red equation answers that question. Right? And again, remember, so this is a solution of the actual problem where both bodies are deformable. So the situation where I have an elastic spherical tip and underneath there is an elastic spherical tip and I apply a certain amount of displacement and I'm interested in the force that is generated due to the contact between these two deformable bodies, it's again from this expression. I'm just condensing that information, that two deformable body problem, into a problem where there appears to be only one, but the parameters that appear are in terms of the parameters of the two deformable surfaces. So the same solution applies to the other one as well. And in fact, uh, that's how we're going to, or how we're going to use, uh, make use of that solution very shortly. So where we're going now is, um, so we have an idea about how to deal with contact. And in general, the problem does require numerical solution schemes. Even at material and geometric nonlinearity, the problem is iteratively solved. It's nonlinear. It's a challenging problem. But in some cases, there is an analytical solution. Okay? So now having come to this stage, based on the tools uh, and ideas we've developed, let's move to something now that sort of makes a link to some of the concepts that we've dis uh, discussed before, in particular discussion of uh, a behavior, material behavior of a solid object in the context of elasticity, in the discussion of a fluid behavior in the context of Navier-Stokes equations, and in fact something that has to do with partially with atomic to continuum scale transition and homogenization and micromechanics. So the thing that makes it connection naturally in this topic to all of those topics is an application of contact mechanics um, to granular media. And you'll see how the picture or the connection now emerges. And the reason I'd like to mention granular media is, as I mentioned last time, it's a strange material. Um, so, one famous problem that's relevant to granular media is slow failure. So, this is something that typically happens when you have uh, a lot of rain, there's a hill, and due to the rain, at some point, what happens is that some portion of the hill, right, it's just there's a landslide generated, slides down, and generates a catastrophe, right? So if you look at this object, right, of course, if it's the hill, right, there's rocks and so on and so forth in between, but eventually, um, locally at least, you can think of this problem when you zoom in, right? So there are two scales to the problem. There is this macroscopic scale that you observe, but microscopically, what you locally have is a material that is some type of soil that is composed of a densely packed right, of varying sizes probably of particles. I'm drawing the particles as though they're all spherical. They're not, of course. In general, they will have all sorts of shapes. And let's say, let's say that is our soil. Now the interesting thing about this, about this problem is if, let's say, the loads, in this case the loads are due to gravity, if the loads are small and let's say the conditions are such that we don't have the failure yet, this thing sits together in one solid piece, so it's like a solid material. But once the conditions are favorable for it to do so, it slides and flows like a fluid. So at some, 
let me say, configuration at some level of equilibrium, let's say, it's like a solid material, but once the conditions are favorable, it flows like a fluid. So it's not a solid, not quite a solid, macroscopically at least, right? Uh, not quite solid or fluid. Now, microscopically, what we're seeing is that, yes, these are composed of actually solid particles, but when we look at that picture, we also see something strange. You might macroscopically model this as a solid or a fluid continuum, uh, depending on the, whether it's sliding or not sliding, but microscopically, there are always solid particles, but it's not a continuum because the individual solid particles are, could be, let's say, elastic or rigid bodies, but in between there are gaps. So it's not even a microscopically, even a continuum. So the microscopic scale cannot be treated throughout as a single continuum. The individual ingredients are continuum particles, but uh, the overall, the microscopic material is not continuum. So that's one example. There are many other examples. So for instance, one uh, example from physics is planetesimal formation. So the idea is, and I'm going to draw a caricature here, you have your rings of, on your planet, right? And if you look here, what you see is that you have tiny, tiny particles, these tiny particles of dust or whatever, if the velocities and conditions are favorable, they will hit each other as they move and they will form aggregates of particles. And if these aggregates of particles grow in size, they can form the seeds of tiny planets that are called infinitesimals, uh, planetesimals, okay? So, um, in this case, you have many particles flowing through a field. Uh, at no stage are they like a solid. They are always like a fluid, but locally, microscopically, when you look in, you have tiny, tiny uh, solid particles that are somehow uh, interacting with each other through the conditions of contact. And that's what's important about the previous problem as well. Microscopically, the condition that governs the motion and deformation of this material is contact conditions between individual particles. If the conditions are favorable for it to stick, it means, or for it not to slide, it means the frictional forces are sufficiently high and well configured to keep this thing standing in one piece like a macroscopically solid material. If not, it flows like a microscopically like a fluid material. There are other important applications like um, granular food processing, You might see as you travel through the uh, countryside, like huge containers for, let's say, wheat, and to store also, therefore, these grander food types, like wheat and rice. And finally, in the drug industry, because drugs, at these pills are usually made by somehow compacting powder. And powder itself is like a granular material. So in all of these conditions, things are governed by contact conditions, microscopically at least. And uh, macroscopically, you might have a solid-like or a fluid-like uh, behavior. Now, of course, if, you want, if you're interested in any one of these problems, let's say you're interested in that problem, or let's say you're interested in simulating how to make a pill from some uh, powder, right? Uh, well, to model the macroscopic process, you would probably be interested in how much, let's say, force should be generated in order to compact a powder into the shape of a pill, let's say, right? And for that calculation, you probably need some macroscopic material behavior model for this microscopic granular media, right? And that such a model you can generate by, let's say, homogenizing this continuum towards some macroscopic solid material. So for instance, in these types of problems, if you homogenize this in the configuration where it doesn't flow, but it deforms a little bit perhaps, but like a solid, 
This thing is typically uh, homogenized towards a elastic plastic type material behavior. In other words, as we know, right, you walk on the sand, you leave footprints. And the reason you leave footprints is because there's some remnant plastic deformation, right? Um, so it's an elastic plastic material, and that behavior macroscopically can be characterized by homogenization. So you can take this as your representative volume element, exert appropriate boundary conditions that have to do with macroscopic strain at a certain region, and find the corresponding stress, model the stress versus strain, you'll get a nonlinear curve that has to do with plasticity, right? When we talked about homogenization, I specifically picked the computational homogenization approach because it's so versatile, it's so conceptually easy, it's a little bit wordy, but now when I describe you the homogenization of this problem, perhaps at least you have, from a few sentences that I've, um, that I've uttered, you have some idea about how one could possibly do that, right? Go to a macroscopic point, take the deformation, impose it as a boundary condition, find the corresponding stress, right? Uh, and find the relation between macroscopic stress and strain. There is also, by the way, a, the, the, the concept of mathematical homogenization, as it suggests, a lot of equations, but that would be very hard to apply to a problem like this, right? So computational homogenization is very versatile. So now, either you can do that and homogenize it, or you can do sort of direct numerical simulation, let me say, in the context of this granular media problem where the whole thing, the whole macroscopic problem you try to solve by resolving the motion of each and every particle. Now, you can imagine that it's going to be super expensive, okay? Uh, but conceptually, it's possible. Either way, either you do microscopic model or full direct numerical simulation of the problem uh, on the full scale, the problem is governed by contact. And what I need is to find out when these particles move, we, I need to have an idea about the force that is generated between these particles, right? So now, to model that problem at, these, at the scale of particle contact, I will make use of the information that we've developed um, so far, okay? And that takes us into granular um, flow simulation. And this, this is an expertise on its own, just like every other special topic that we discuss. Each one, in fact, in some topics, there are several subtopics that, that are, they are courses on its own. This one is uh, one such special topic. Sometimes numerically it's referred to as the discrete element method. Versus the, let's say, the finite element method where you try to numerically model a continuum. In this case, you don't have a really a continuum microscopically, so you have a discrete, con discrete uh, material distribution. So you cannot really use the finite element method, you use the discrete element method, let's say. And that's how you simulate uh, granular flows. And as I said, uh, the idea is going to have to do with applying some knowledge of contact mechanics on the particle scale. Well, let's do that. Let's at least make an attempt. So I'm going to try to solely work with, let's say, a pair of particles, okay? Overall, the idea will be to somehow move the particles when there is a force exerted on them. But as they move, I need to make sure that if two particles or many particles contact each other, I take care of it properly so that the particles do not unphysically move through each other, right? They have to touch and some forces need to be generated. So the idea is going to be based on detecting contact, which we've discussed extensively, right? Uh, and then after we detect contact, if there is contact, I need to calculate forces. And once I have forces, I can use equations of motion. Let's say if I model every particle as a rigid body, I know the force. Perhaps there are also moments. I know the moments. And I update the position and rotation of the particle according to the forces and the moments. So this is where rigid body dynamics also comes in. Okay? Update the po positions. And once you update the positions, now you have a new configuration for the setup particles. You go back, you check if there is contact again, you update the forces, update the positions, and 
update, keep updating through time, and your simulation gives you a picture of how this material flows or deforms, depending on whether it looks like a fluid or a solid. Um, so, well, now let's do this on two particles. Okay. So I have two particles. Um, this one has radius, let's say, R2. That one has radius R1. Uh, there is a coordinate system somewhere. The position here is R2. The position there is R1. Okay. So this is my particle 1. This is my particle 2. So first, given two particles, I need to find out if there is contact between them. Now, the distance between the particles is clearly R1 minus R2, but we don't know if there is penetration or not. So applying the ideas that we discussed for contact detection, now why can I, what I can do simply in this scenario is I can calculate the distance, and if the distance is less than the sum of the two radii, if these are spherical particles, right, and that's how I've drawn them presently, okay. That's my assumption at this stage. If uh, R1 is, if D is less than the sum of the radii, then they are in contact because then the picture that I have is the following. Right? This is the first, this is the second particle. I calculate the distance, and the distance is less than this radius plus that radius, so there is clearly some uh, penetration between the two particles, and the amount of penetration is delta. Uh, now, the vector that points from the center of the first particle to the second particle, I will indicate that to be the normal direction. Okay. First of all, the penetration. or normal gap, whatever you call it. I'm going to use the notation delta because that's what we've developed in the context of the Hertz problem. That's what we've used in that problem, and I'm going to make use of that solution shortly. I'm going to define the penetration to be R1 plus R2 minus D. So that's greater than zero if there is contact. So it's like gamma for the continuum contact detection setup, all right? And now, in the continuum contact problem, I had a certain amount of local penetration gamma, and I penalized it through some penalty parameter, and I generated a pressure. That was an approximation of the Lagrange multiplier idea, the red line you might remember, that enforces no penetration. Now, in this case, I'm not really looking at the local deformation of two continuum objects penetrating each other. I'm looking at two spherical objects moving towards each other, and they penetrate by each other, not locally, right? Delta is the maximum penetration, if you like. So this is exactly the parameter that appears in the Hertz problem. You have two spherical tips contacting each other. There is a certain amount of force that generates a certain amount of approach between the two spherical tips. So given the amount of generation, uh, penetration, I know exactly what the force is. We've calculated in the Hertz problem. The force is, I'll borrow the same relation, 4 over 3 R That's the relation. So here we are obviously assuming that we're invoking the assumptions underlying the Hertz problem, in particular the two particles are elastic. Of course, if they are not elastic, then this relation is not true. 
in that case, you might somehow have some other components uh, that affect the force. But I'm presently invoking the assumptions that underlie the Hertz problem. Okay? So now that force acts on the second particle in that direction and in the first particle in that direction and tries to prevent those two particles from further penetrating each other. So now, once you have, right, we've detected contact, we calculated the force, now we want to update the positions. Well, how do we do that? Well, we have from linear momentum balance of a rigid body, we know that mass times acceleration, rate of change of the linear momentum is equal to the first force, which is minus F times N on the first object, right? F is the magnitude and the direction is minus N. And on the second object, it's M2 F N. And here N numerically is something you calculate by making use of the particle positions. All right. So now I have the equations of motion and the way you update now those particle positions is very simple. In fact, when we, dis we, we, we covered um, um, atomic to continuum scale transition, at some point I said, well, you could equilibrate the particles uh, by making use of molecular dynamics because the initial configuration of our crystal when we were invoking the Cauchy-Born hypothesis, it had to be in equilibrium. It had to be a situation or a configuration where the individual atoms had a net force of zero around them, okay? So now if you look in this picture, if this bud, if this soil is static, it's not moving anywhere, the net force on every particle also needs to vanish, okay? And so instead of atoms now, now we have particles, each of which is a rigid body. So computationally, just like you would have tons of atoms, here also we have tons of particles. So the numerical setup is very, very similar. Similar, you have either atoms or solid particles, but you have tons of them. And in between them, there are forces. In the atomic case, you have molecular forces, right? Due to, based on, let's say, the, uh, the Leonard-Jones potential, you can calculate what the forces are. In this case, the forces come from contact. Okay. If they don't contact, they don't have any force between them. When they do, there is a force. But subsequently, the idea is also similar in molecular dynamics as well. Once you calculate the force or the net force on an object, in this case as well, the net force on the particle, in this case, it comes in, co into contact only with one other particle. So that's the net force. In molecular dynamics as well, you would have the same equation. Mass acceleration equals force. And well, how do we find now the new positions and the way you would find it is to invoke some numerical integration in time, okay? So for either particle, you have the force divided by m, you know what the acceleration is. The acceleration is second derivative of the position in time. So this is what I need to numerically integrate uh, to update the position. Okay, um, and here you can invoke many different time discretization schemes. I'll invoke one that immediately will ring a bell. It's central difference. And here you work as follows. Well, suppose I give you the configuration at a certain time step, let me call uh, K. So we're taking time steps, right? time step one, two, three, four, and as I take those time steps, the material, the granular material flows or deforms like a solid. Uh, at any given configuration, it's, so I detected contact, calculated the forces. So this is the acceleration at that configuration. So acceleration at that configuration is the force at that configuration divided by the mass. So I know what this is. And I know what the positions at that time step also, and let's call them xk. So, now, the acceleration at that time, at that step, is discretized in terms of the position in the context of central, di central difference as such. 
Okay, so here um, k is the time step we're at, and delta t is the step size. So I know the configuration of every particle at the previous time step. I know the configuration of every particle at this time step. I know the net force on every particle, and therefore I know the acceleration on every particle from the force. So I know what this is, and therefore I can update the position of every particle towards the next time step. Okay? So that's how now discrete element method would work, or molecular dynamics would work. You know the earlier positions, you calculate the forces, update towards the new configuration. Okay. Now, of course, there are tons of details that are involved. It would be really unfair to sort of say that, oh, this is how it's done, it's very simple. It's not, there are a lot of details, but that's the major idea. And we are discussing this idea presently in the context of granular media, which is governed by contact mechanics. And as I said, we've come to this very description of the force through various stages, starting with description of two surfaces, how they interact with each other, how we can, uh, let me say, geometrically characterize the, the two surfaces and so on. And now, as an application, we're looking at a particular type of material behavior, namely uh, granular media. Okay? Uh, now, as I said, there are difficulties involved. Let me mention, at least in this context, two difficulties. Now, first of all, of course, you don't have two particles. You have tons of particles. So one difficulty is to figure out what is contacting what? Okay? Because if I don't know that, I don't know what the forces are, and I, therefore I cannot update the positions of the particles correctly. So you have a simulation box, and in this simulation box, you have, now I don't want to draw, a lot of circles. So I'm just throwing in a lot of points just to indicate that we have, you get the point, tons of particles in my simulation domain, right? Now, probably I already managed to put here maybe several hundred, maybe 300, I don't know, points, <laughs> I don't know. So <laughs> now, I know the configuration. Now, okay, so let me go ahead and check if these particles are contacting each other. So what you need to do is you need to look for contact pairs. You can look up, check, pick a particle. <coughs> okay, so now I need to see if that particle contacts any other particle because this, I, I'm just throwing in here a point. It actually has a radius and the point, the particle here also has a radius. It might happen that they are actually contacting each other. So I need to check whether this one contacts that and that and that and that and that and that. So I need to make n, if there are n particles, I mean roughly n, right? n minus one doesn't make my life easier because n is super large, all right. Well, I've done that, but I've checked this particle with every other particle. How about this particle and every other particle? And how about that particle with every other particle and so on? So if you go ahead and want to do this in a brute force fashion in the manner that I described, so we have n particles, and the challenge is that n is very large, and if you want to check contact one by one, the cost is going to scale with order n squared. And n squared is going to be very expensive as soon as n is sufficiently large. So this will suck up most of your simulation time. So that's not something you like to do. So that's the first challenge. You need to figure out a clever way of finding out which particle is interacting with which other particle. In fact, a similar situation is occurring in the context of, um, in the context of molecular dynamics because in molecular dynamics, yes, things don't really contact each other, but 
every particle interacts with every other particle. This one interacts theoretically with the one over there as well because there are far field interactions, right? So, but remember, in that context, we didn't really need to consider particles that are far away or atoms that are far away because eventually the forces decay very rapidly. So we introduced a cutoff radius. So that cutoff radius can be introduced or thought of as a region of influence like contact. So there are certain particles it can interact with. Just like here, there are certain particles it can contact with. If you go ahead and brutally calculate all of the forces, then you're going to spend a lot of time. Okay? So there should be an efficient way of dealing with the particles that it can potentially interact with. And one such idea is called the binning algorithm. Okay? So without any detailed discussion, the major idea is to chop up your domain into smaller squares, the size of which should be chosen optimally. And then you say, well, okay, so these are my red squares. They are subdomains of the whole simulation domain. And now, for instance, I am interested in, let's say, that particle. And then I tell myself, OK, I somehow keep a track of the fact that this blue particle is in this red subdomain. And this red subdomain is far away from that red subdomain. So at no point do I need to consider the interaction of this one and that one. The only regions that I potentially need to consider are this one with those, right? Because those are neighboring subdomains. There is no way this one will interact with that subdomain, right? So immediately I discard tons of particles for potential contact check. Now, if you do that cleverly, if you apply the binning algorithm, um, so this is essentially an efficient update um, for a list of potential contacts or potential contact pairs. If you do that cleverly, the cost scales, this is always something that one would like to have. If you have n degrees of freedom. If you double the number of degrees of freedom, you want to have the cost at most doubling, ideally. And this is what you obtain here. You scale with n. And then the simulation becomes, um, becomes manageable, because you know that if instead of 1,000, you throw in 2,000 particles, it's just going to be twice as expensive. Okay? Whereas in the other case, it's not the situation. It becomes super expensive very quickly. So that's one difficulty. And there are ways of dealing with it. Difficulty number two, and this one is very specific uh, to granular media, is the particle shape. And this is where now, even at the particle scale, you have to make use of the methods that we have discussed at the beginning of the course and make use of curvilinear coordinates. So suppose you have two particles that are not now spherical. Okay? I'm, I am picking them to be convex, right? They don't even have to be convex. In other words, they can be of that shape. And then life is even easier, right? So this is a alternative scenario. Okay, this is harder. But let's look at that case where we have convex particles still, but they are not spherical. Uh, and I'm trying to detect contact. Well, in the case of a sphere, you just have the central position, right? This one has a certain orientation. 
and you just check for the distance between the two. If it's less than R1 plus R2, boom, you have contact. That's not the situation here because this distance might be sufficiently large, but contact might be initiated at the tip. So you have to search for contact. In order to do that, you have to endow these surfaces somehow with some sort of a curvilinear coordinate system and work on the curvilinear, curvilinear coordinate system and introduce tangent vectors, normals, et cetera, and check for potential contacts at different points and make sure that uh, the t any two point, any two pair is not penetrating each other. And if these are three dimensional objects, you have to have locally at least two curvilinear coordinates on each one. But in any case, conceptually, the idea is simple. In this case, you can make sure that still that there is no contact between the two particles by checking distance at a special point. Okay? And that special point is the following. So first of all, I can pick that point and pick its closest point projection. Okay? This is not the correct, point to, correct way to check. In other words, if I pick this point and make the closest point projection is positive, I cannot ensure that there is no contact because as you see here, this distance is smaller. And similarly, if I pick that point and make a closest point projection, it doesn't ensure that the bodies are not contacting each other. The special point is, so let me put a cross there and a cross there. If you pick a point such that the vector that connects the two points is perpendicular to both surfaces, in other words, it, the normals of the two points align, this is the point where you have minimum distance throughout the interface. And if this distance is positive, there is no force, okay? So there is no contact, right? So this is minimum distance, okay? That's what you should be checking, right? So there is some additional effort involved in the calculation of the minimum distance when you're dealing with a particle shape that differs from um, the spherical case. And so you have to scan and find closest point across the surfaces. And that's where directly all the methods that we've discussed, the, the, the mathematics of surfaces come, comes into play. Right? Uh, now, moreover, now in the case of uh, spherical particles, you don't have to really worry about rotations because these things are going to move whether or they are rotating or not. Doesn't have a, really any, uh, let me say, big influence on the dynamics of that simulation if there is no friction. And that's what I've assumed, there is no friction. In this case, however, the rotation is important because that's probably how these two bodies come into contact to begin with. I have two objects. They are not uh, spherical. Let's say they are very actually thin and long. The way they come into contact could be not necessarily like that, but they move and contact by rotating, right? So in order to deal with the dynamics in this situation of the granular media, you need an update not only of the positions, but also of the rotational configuration, right? And that's where, again, the topic, the, the ideas that we discuss in the context of rigid body dynamics, that was our first special topic, that's where it comes into play. So you need the moment of inertia, you need the efficient update of that moment of inertia that we've discussed, and then you need an update for the orientation and a description of that orientation in 3D, okay? Um, so, so, so that would be a way to address the second difficulty. So with that, uh, I think this does actually finally conclude the course. That was our last special topic. As I said, I tried to pick all of these special topics in a way that they interact with each other. And I tried to mention those interactions um, when I had the chance. And, uh, and overall, I hope now you have a, the, the, the picture that, that, that based on the, solely based on what we've described in the first part of the course, right? The fundamentals. We've described those and repeatedly made use of the mathematics and the physics of continuum mechanics in all of these special topics. And we've seen how those mathematics, the tools, 
and the phys physical ideas that were developed come into play in many, many different contexts that have to do with different kinds of material behavior at different scales. We've discussed how to efficiently address those scales, et cetera. So the idea here was, yes, to say that continuum mechanics is very useful, but at the same time to say that continuum mechanics is very much alive today, and it's a very, very useful tool to attack um, different problems that are on their own very interesting and I would say quite challenging, actually. So I hope you've enjoyed the ride, and uh, I'll see you at least one more time in the final exam, right? Okay. So, well, thank you very much. <laughs>